Listen up, everybody. Your fantasy football drafts are coming. It's time to show your league what puny and pathetic trash bags they truly are. The ultimate draft kit from the fantasy footballers is the easiest way to annihilate them. Tiered rankings, full projections, sleepers, breakouts, it's got it all. Go to ultimatedraftkit.com and secure yours immediately. I said do it now. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Monday, August 7th, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Jason Moore, Mike Wright, I'm Andy Holloway. Welcoming you to another week. The NFL season approaches. We're with you every day. I just spent about four to five minutes watching every Jordan Love throw from the from the Green Bay Packer game. Please give us the uh, review. Uh, he, I mean... It's it's you know inner team scrimmage, so they're not like trying to harm each other as they do in an NFL game. I thought he looked okay. Like it was, I was looking more for also like, does he have any tendencies? And it was interesting that it started with two deep shots to Romeo Dobbs. I did see some Romeo Dobbs uh, deep highlights when he yep. beat Jair Alexander. Yeah, the, was that was, one of them? Yep, it was the unfortunately there was an overthrow. I I think Jordan Love's underrated. I I brought him up for on, fantasy purposes on last week on the Dynasty Pod of like when we we broke it down in the division of just like he set up for such success that I don't I'm not calling for Jordan Love to be the next big thing, but it's we should leave a little bit of room for margin that what if like if he's good, then he's then he is set up instantly to have not top five, but like he can be a, a real solid streamer, even a top end quarterback too. Jason, we talked about this a little bit. The fact that their structure is set up in a way that he could come in and be very successful. It's a little reminiscent of like Geno Smith coming into the sure. Seattle situation where you know what to expect. You have talent, you have uh, a defense, a head coach, you have a, you know, a number of years where they've, been competitive so you put him in a position he wasn't he's not a rookie right he's been behind Aaron Rodgers who uh for the record he has a great relationship with yes very close <laughs> a little surprising but true um yeah no I I, I like betting on well-run franchises like it, it it seems maybe a little too simple but I find that when you've got an organization that has just succeeded for a long time and obviously Part of that has been they've had great quarterbacks for about thirty hundred years running. Yes, that's accurate. Um, but still, organizations that build rosters in smart ways and have good coaching are usually good fantasy bets as well. Yeah, and players like Aaron Jones certainly help you out in the passing game, and we don't want to underestimate that. Uh, lots to talk about today. We got news. We are into the running back rankings countdown couple things I want to remind people about at the top. Now that we're into August, I want to let people know, we will be having our Megala Show live event in Los Angeles, end of this month. Tickets available at BallersLive.com. Um, not a lot of tickets available, but there are some remaining. We have a lot of, uh, you know, we've, we've done multiple cities in the past. This year we've got one big, huge, Larger than ever before show at the Palace Theater, August 26th. Check that out at BallersLive.com if you are within, I think we said 3,000 yeah, 3, miles. Yeah, if you're within 3,000 miles of L.A., which we is... We expect you. Yeah, If I you're mean, within 3,000, anything beyond that... They, they have an international airport for sure, but if you are in the L.A. <laughs> area, you got to come and check it out. Yep. There, there's, there's some seats left. It's going to be a wild and fun and awesome night. The biggest show we've ever done. And there may be some more surprises we'll tell you about here soon. So grab your ticket while you can. 
And then the ultimate draft kit is available. You heard our good friend at the top of the, <laughs> at the top of the show. Um, De- great, just great friend. Yeah, and definitely, definitely him. Uh, <laughs> UltimateDraftKit.com. <laughs> Always updated. We got some big news on Alvin Kamara. We're going to talk about momentarily. That has already been accounted for in the ultimate draft kit. Got more news about the Saints backfield beyond Alvin Kamara this morning as well. Always up to date. Gets you prepped up for your draft. Lots of premium resources in terms of analytics so you can break things down. Um, We've got consistency charts. I don't think we talk about those enough, but you can look at players and how they perform week to week. We actually give you con- give them consistency grades based on their week-to-week performance, uh, their volatility, their beta, so to speak. If, you, if you're into the like stock Ooh. stock market mm, world, okay. they're, they're they're beta. I like oh, it. I, mean, we see. I thought you were attacking the alphas. Uh, we have alphas in there too. We got betas. We got calling them low T carotene. over here. Carotene. Um, <laughs> UltimateDraftKit.com to check that out. Is that a Is beta that- carotene joke? <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> News and notes from around the league. Presented by USAA Insurance. (laughs) Alvin Kamara has been suspended three games for his role in a fight outside the Las Vegas nightclub in 2022. And now we know. Mm -hmm. We didn't know. Would it be four, five, one? I mean, what other numbers? What other numbers are there? Could have been two. Mike actually said he had to increase his ranking of Alvin Kamara because he had. He had kind of pre-guessed four, way off. <laughs> and um, my bad. You know, it it is a really difficult thing. The Alvin Kamara draft cost. Mike just brought him up on our Ice and Fire episode. Um, obviously, with the suspension, you're going to be without him during a very important part, the beginning of the season. Uh, you don't get to put him on the IR which is something that, you know, if you knew you were missing, let's say, Javante for two weeks, which apparently you're not, but somebody like that, at least you could put him on IR. Now you know the 28-year-old Alvin Kamara, former fantasy superstar, is going to be on the shelf for three weeks. You have a rookie and, and Kendra Miller, who we all really like the talent of. You have um, uh, Jamal Williams, who was very effective in, in the red zone last year. And then they're kicking the tires on Kareem Hunt this morning because Eno Benjamin – uh, Torres Achilles, who was part of their depth chart at running back. I say all this because, you know, one of the beat writers that I know we all trust quite a bit is Nick Underhill mm-hmm. uh, in in New Orleans. And he released an article recently just talking about some of the things that the team observed about what made Alvin Kamara less efficient last year, that they fixed this offseason, and they are very excited about his his potential in the offense. We talked about Derek Carr. He throws to the running back about middle of the pack in that regard. Do you, did you read the part where they were they had to balance out his legs? Yeah, it's one of the keys to running. <laughs> like apparently there was a asymmetrical muscle situation. Yeah. with his legs. Yeah. So I, look, Alvin Kamara was in the one strong leg club last year. We just didn't know about it. And and so I. I guess I say all that because there's going to be a draft price of Alvin Kamara that is very cheap, and he's a big name. And the and the ice show said maybe just pass on that. Yeah. But I mean, if Alvin Kamara is, I'm I'm going to be real with the people. I'm going to tell you, if I'm sitting in the fifth sixth round, and I see Alvin Kamara's name, and I'm making a decision between Alvin Kamara and give me give me a running back, and AJ Dillon. Okay. That is going to be a hard situation psychologically for fantasy players well let me tell you right now who he's going around uh maybe so so maybe it won't be so hard yeah i don't i don't think it'll be quite as uh easy or difficult uh alvin Kamara or joe mixon they're going right next to each other right now that's stupid joe mixon's gonna go way (laughs) way higher should go way higher that one's not doesn't make sense okay alvin Kamara or aaron jones well, that yeah, that's stupid. Too. Okay, Alvin, that's not hard. Alvin Kamara or Miles Sanders. Yeah, that's stupid. Yeah, so Alvin Kamara still needs to drop a little bit in ADP uh, okay. to get where because we in, are comfortable drafting him. in ADP. He is right now in the four eleven. We're looking at this is ADP based off of the sleeper platform, but that's going to change. But just in case, let's throw him into the sixth round. All right, for you. Andy. That's where I think he'll be. Yeah, and so if we're in the sixth round, we're talking about uh, Alexander Madison, James Connor. 
Javante Williams. Okay, this ain't that hard. Yeah, I'll take all <laughs> yeah, three of those. Yeah, let's just pass there. on Kamara. Glad we figured that out. <laughs> now, now, what if you put him in the eighth round because they signed Kareem Hunt and people freak out even more? Okay, uh, so you want some eighth round guys? Yeah. All right, all right. that's where A.J. Dillon is. Yeah, I'll yeah. take okay. you got Alvin one? Kamara over A.J. Dillon. James Cook. Not, uh, <laughs> Antonio Gibson. I'll probably take the shot on Cook. Gibson's tough. I would go Gibson. I think that's that's the line right there. That would be uh, if I had enough running backs in the eighth round, and I can wait. I'll take Kamara. Yep, but it. Yeah, all right. So he needs to drop four rounds. Yeah, see, he ne right. he needs to pretty much plummet. Which is his ADP is interesting because at the even at the four eleven, it's like you, people we knew a suspension was going to happen. I guess people were betting that it was just going to be a game. And then I at, thought, yeah, at, I thought two was in the cards. But even at even a two game suspension at four eleven, when you could be like Miles Sanders, Pierce, Acres are going way after that, or at least a full round. It was, I don't know, it was just interesting for someone who was so inefficient last year. I don't, know, I, I have my concerns about it. Does Kamara still have the juice? I mean, maybe no. With that his, <laughs> yeah, or oh or has super, has super Kamario. Fallen okay. uh, right. to the wrath of the Goombas. I forgot we had that. Yeah. That didn't sound good. But it's, again, you know, we're, we're just giving you our opinions and we're trying to help you build up the, 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 way, the best way forward for you to make your own decisions. Because there's going to be people who are still in on Alvin Kamara. There, today's a running back show, so we're getting into the running back countdown shortly. Kamara uh, not in the top 20. Not in the top 20. Uh, the Saints, uh, Rashid Shahid. Traquan Smith left practice with groin injuries. Are they officially on groinindex.com? Yes, always. Nobody tracks off-season <laughs> groin injuries, no. in-season groin injuries like the Fantasy Footballers podcast. That thing is is very fast. If that's what you're about, if you need the latest, greatest groin news, we've got it. <laughs> and, and don't forget, if you haven't been to groinindex.com, we do have their most recent quotes yes. uh, on all of these players as that's well. That's true. We've asked each player to tell us how they're feeling do you have shortly do you after have one, Jason or I do no I do I so Traquan Smith is what he said ack my groin uh, um Kenneth Walker is ah my groin right uh so there I mean there's a, a slew of uh different quotes here <laughs> all right and then uh tomorrow is our uh, top 10 running backs so today is 20 through 11 counting down the top 10 tomorrow however I'm not holding this Josh Jacobs this is why it's really, really difficult uh, when a player's not in camp is because you don't know what's truth, what's reality. You know, M NBC's Mike Florio reporting the Chiefs and Broncos both have interest in Josh Jacobs. There were reports that the team may rescind his franchise tag and make him a free agent. There was an so interview with the general manager that I watched this weekend talking about, they were asking him about the Saquon situation. Did that open the door? There was talk that Josh Jacobs already turned down $12 million, which I think is what Saquon ended up getting. And, you know, I don't I don't know where this team's going to be. Josh McDaniels came out. He said, I don't blame a player for doing what they think is right for themselves. Um, it seems like the team's mindset is they want him in camp. Like, here, here's the confidence I have. If he comes back, I think you'll see utilization that is the same as last year because this team wants to run him into the ground and say goodbye. Um, the, the GM basically said that, like they want him to come in here that their argument is have a season like you did last year. And then you're going to get paid a bunch of money. And then, uh, Josina Anderson on X said, my understanding is the Raiders are open in, open to restarting talks with Josh Jacobs in hopes of getting him to rejoin the team. I mean, this feels like something put out by the team as well. Yeah. And Devonte Adams, <clears throat> he's come out and he, you know, he obviously wants the best players there in town. It, it, He'll it's be a murky, alone on an Island without Josh. Jacobs. It is a murky situation, but in, in the end, the running back has no leverage and really almost no choice. So I, I believe he will end up playing this year for the Raiders on the franchise tag because when push comes to shove, it's just the only option yeah. in his control. He, he just, uh, he has no power. I, he, is, Zamir White's a discussion worth yes, having yes, because he he's the backup running back now running with the ones. Uh, Amir Abdullah will be heavily involved. Unfortunately, if, if Jacobs didn't play, you will see both of those players, which will be annoying because there's not a lot of confidence in the success of this team. 
However, like pay attention to this. Does Zemir White because yeah he's a six foot two hundred and fifteen pound running back who has great speed he ran a four four that puts him ninety sixth percentile weight adjusted speed score that's what you really want for a running back and if he's got opportunity that is vacated by Josh Jacobs uh, certainly certainly worth a shot I really like the part where it's the two divisional opponents who are like yeah we're we'd be very interested in our division <laughs> see this is where you don't like, it's like what stop it you don't just know if josh it. jacobs puts that piece out <laughs> right and then uh it, it's just tough right now a couple other injuries rookie running back uh one of jason's um secret oh. my guys devon a chain day to day with an injury was injured in saturday's practice Chase Edmonds expected to open as the Bucks' third down back. I saw more praise for him this morning. That's that's newsworthy. Yeah, it um, is because of Rashad White. Rashad White is a volume based only pick. Like it, he didn't do anything on the field last year with Tom Brady um, to make you believe that he was a really great NFL player. But the opportunity that he has without Leonard Fournette and his pass catching ability that says, hey, I mean, he could just volume his way to a decent fantasy finish. And that's why I think a lot of people, there, there's, a, there's a handful of people that are really in on Rashad White at his current ADP. I have not been betting on Rashad White. but it, I, I think he's interesting. Yeah, and it, it, but if he loses some yeah. third down work and the pass catching work without Tom Brady throwing the ball 700 times, all of a sudden, I mean, yeah. you just lose a lot well, of the luster. I reacted strongly to it immediately when I saw this news and then it was like a little bit of a correction back to to where like Chase Edmonds has been a bad football player for two years and so do, do I believe that Rashad White's a more capable talented player I do um it, you know it's something to pay attention to certainly and the the it, just another piece of it is like okay well if Chase Edmonds is the guy that the team wants on the field in those obvious passing situation it's does does Chase Edmonds then become like also the the two minute drill type of player? Because we do for football, we can overreact to oh well, this player's there on third down. Well, it's you know, how many passes are running backs actually catching on third down? It's not as high as you would think, but yeah, Kyle, you're on. Are you on the microphone, Kyle? Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> what was the percentage of <laughs> <laughs> just running back to the oh, Yeah, I'm here. What was the percentage of third down plays last year? You were doing some analysis on third downs. It's about twenty percent of the plays, so it's a lot less than we realize. I think uh, often when we use the phrase like the third down back, it's it's, it's really pa not, it's, it's passing it's down pass catching yeah. back. It's the two minute drill back. Yeah. It's and the, come come back player when it, you're trying to get back into a exactly. game. Exactly. It's not specifically just how often yeah. they're out there on the third down only. Yeah, uh, I think you make a good point. Kyle's analysis is kind of just worthless. Yeah, the, you can go back way. to the fridge now, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Full sprint to the microphone wherever he is. Um, Cardinals. <laughs> oh, do we have the button? Can somebody? Can somebody <laughs> help me? Mediocre signing of the week. Marlon, Matt, Kenyon, Drake have both been signed to play football this year. The Cardinals bringing on Marlon Mack and uh, the Colts adding Kenyon Drake. There you go. Okie dokie. <laughs> that was today's news and notes presented by USAA Insurance. Learn more at USAA.com slash insurance. Running backs. All right, here we go. The running back countdown begins with none other than Alexander Madison at number 20. He snuck in. He snuck into the top 20. Um, Mike has him the highest at 16. Shocker. Shocker. <laughs> I'm, I'm at 21. Jason's at 23. I, I don't. Well, I have him a, a good bit higher than Jason, but me and Andy aren't that far off. Uh, running back 22 by ADP, sixth round pick. So, yeah, I'm taking Madison over Alvin Kamara, as we said earlier. Um, Dalvin Cook is gone, and when he's been absent due to injury, uh, Alexander Madison has taken advantage of those limited opportunities. He's averaged 16.9 fantasy points per game when he's been out. Um, you know, we have a we have a head coach that we like for this offense. Uh, Dalvin Cook ran a ton of routes last year, and so that's part of the discussion here around. It's not that Alexander Madison should be played in fantasy. Of course he should. 
it's really a discussion about what what's his range of outcomes? How good could he be in this offense? What is the ceiling for Alexander Madison from a talent and involvement perspective? How how many other backs will be involved? I mean, I, I went back to 2020, 2021, kind of looking at different running backs that had okay years, right? Like David Montgomery in Chicago had a couple of seasons that were like, all right, he finished around where we have him ranked. It's 20th. Uh, but you wouldn't have put, he wasn't a key cog to a championship run. So when you take Alexander Madison, you seem to be getting a discount due to the fact that he's unproven as a starter. Um, he's not been, you know, ratcheted up draft boards like Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson are at the wide receiver position where you expect a huge monster top 10 season. So what do you, what do we think about Madison? Yeah, as as the uh, lowest ranked uh, analyst Hater. on Madison here, I, I'll, I'll say that he has an extremely high ceiling. Uh, the outcome for him to have success is a very obvious path. They've talked about using him in a three down uh, role to where he is more involved in the pass catching as well. The routes run is a huge question mark here of like is, is he going to be very involved in the passing game because to me you, you've got him 200 200 to 250 on the carry count like that's where I think he's going to land somewhere uh, and that that's a valuable role so that's good for being a, a running back too the question about your upside will become what is the passing role and if he takes a big share of that I mean, this is a good offense with a bad defense. It's going to score a lot of points, and he's been talented on the field. I also believe that he's going to end up a value on draft day because ADPs lag. They just lag. They, we spent this whole offseason not knowing about whether or not he was the guy. If you started this offseason, if, if we left the last season and they, we cut Dalvin Cook immediately, the Vikings shipped him off, Alexander Madison's ADP today would be much much higher he'd be in the fourth and so i i think by the time drafts roll around it's still going to be nerfed a little bit from the the adp fears of over drafting a player my my hesitancy around madison has just always been related to how good i think he is relative to other people the efficiency numbers for him are nowhere near where dalvin cook was historically uh per warren sharp over the last two years among 74 running backs with 100 attempts 68th out of those 74 in yards per carry, 43rd in explosive rush rate, 42nd in yards after contact per carry. Uh, you you give a player like that a ton of volume, are are those numbers going to change? Right. That's that, that's kind of the worry. We, we've heard Ty Chandler has not been impressive in camp. When you look at the depth chart, you've got Dwayne McBride. He's a seventh-round pick. You've got uh, Kenny Nwangwu, who's been special teams historically. Um, I don't know how heavily involved, like, it, it almost feels like the Las Vegas backfield room last year where we all should have just known it was going to be Jacobs because nobody else really had what it what it takes. And I still think Minnesota is going to be a pretty good team. So they have confidence in Madison. Yeah. They, Otherwise, they would have brought somebody else in. Their actions th thus far have said that. I've also seen the reports, though, that none of the backup running backs have really taken control over, that, over being the, the second man up, which – that puts the the Vikings on watch for me for a team that could be in the in the sweepstakes to try and pull Zeke Leonard Fournette one of these known veterans. Uh, I I would think that even if they add one of those players, Alexander Madison still going to be the first player up. But it, it and it it comes down to like what are the coaches going to decide here because it had been with uh, under Coach Zimmer. You had Dalvin Cook and Madison. They were sharing a lot more of the snaps. But this past season, because you had a, a, a new regime, you have O'Connell in charge up there in Minnesota, 72% of the snaps for Dalvin Cook, which is by far the highest snap share that he had seen in a season, is O'Connell a three – is is he really a three-down running back type of coach? If that's what happens with Alexander Madison – with the the amount of points that the Vikings offense are going to have to score, because the the Vikings are in sneaky soft rebuild right here, their defense is going to be really bad, really really bad. So they're they're counting on their offense to keep them in game. So I'm very excited. I think the ceiling is tremendous for Alexander Madison. 
We don't know if, if he's NFL good yet because he's good when he's the guy, but the last couple years as the backup hasn't been tremendous. 320 opportunities for Dalvin Cook last year led to a running back 10 finish. And the pass catching was th it was 39 receptions. So those are some numbers to keep in your mind. I don't know if that puts number 10 around the ceiling for Madison. If he had a season like Cook, I know a lot of people believe Cook lost a step. But that's kind of the landscape for Alexander Madison. Let's take a quick break and move on to our number 19 running back. All right, at number 19, we recently uh, revealed a quote from him on the show. Uh, Kenneth Walker the third, just 22.8 years old. The RB15 right now, by way of ADP, we all have him below that at 17. That's where I have him. Mike at 20, Jason at 21. Uh, he makes me feel so stupid. <laughs> me or Kenneth Walker? Kenneth Walker. Uh, Kenneth Walker makes me feel so dumb. Explain. I'm terrified to draft him because I love Charbonnet. And we've talked about the fact that he's a pass-catching back, Charbonnet is. He's a bigger move-the-pile type of back. So goal line, touchdown, uh, receiving, second-round draft capital. And so I'm so terrified to draft Kenneth Walker. And in the end, that could be just outrageously dumb. Because what did we see last year? We saw a young, stud, awesome running back who was like a top five fantasy running back, and he's on a great offense. Like We, I, I, we should love Kenneth Walker. Does, we should yeah. want him on our team. It feels like there weren't really problems with Kenneth Walker until Zach Charbonnet was drafted, and because he was drafted – we're going to find problems with Kenneth Walker. That's, exactly. It feels a little bit like that. And we, we have talked extensively, and we'll repeat it because, you know, a lot more people listening here in August. But we know some things about Seattle. The running backs get hurt. They draft first-round running backs all the time. Um, and it, it we don't know exactly how that first-round running back is going to have uh, – what kind of impact they're going to have. You know, you had Chris Carson – who, when Rashad Penny was drafted, people faded him, and then he was really effective. It, it's a very difficult situation because, like you said, we could all look really, really dumb to have him down in the fourth round here, and Kenneth Walker could easily finish as the number five running back on the season. Yes. Only And all that has to happen is the team has to give him a bunch of work and, and say that Zach Charbonnet is more of a compliment. The only threat to Walker is Charbonnet being a kind of a timeshare 50-50 type of back, which we don't have – Right now, we've had injury to Charbonnet in, in training camp. We don't have a reason to believe, and Walker, but we don't have a reason to believe that Charbonnet is going to have that opportunity, or maybe that opportunity happens 10 weeks into the season, and you lose 10 weeks of great Kenneth Walker play because of, of fear. So it's tough. Walker's so young, so dynamic. A big play. He's fun to have in fantasy because mm -hmm. big plays can win you a week. Yeah, he's a home run hitting running back who – was not tremendous in short yardage. So last year, here's some of the inefficiencies. You had 17 carries inside the 10, only two rushing touchdowns. That's that's not the numbers that you want to see. 24% of his carries failed to gain a single yard. That puts him at 63rd among running backs. And uh, like, it, so it's just does Pete Carroll look at that? Was was that part of the, of the reason of like, well, I'm going to get Zach Charbonnet on this team because Walker is. Uh, he's not as big as Zach Charbonnet, and he's not as smooth catching the ball. So there are huge concerns, but it because of the home run ability of Kenneth Walker, you can have weeks where his his fantasy finish will outproduce the actual volume that he that he had, which will make him volatile. He could be have he could be at fourteen carries, but one of those carries could be a thirty plus yard rushing touchdown because that's the type of player that he is. So it's it's going to be up and down. It's pretty scary, but there's also the stuff of, of Seattle, like Andy was saying. Chris Carson was uh, was still the guy, despite the drafting of Rashad Penny in the first round. So Kenneth Walker could still be the guy. Like, and, and there's that, been, that could end up that way. There's been commentary from the local beat reporters to that end. Right. The, the expectation is that Kenneth Walker is going to get the majority of the work. Like That just came out last week. So um, it is a really tough situation because – you know, we're not going to talk about Zach Charbonnet today or tomorrow. Like, right. He's not part of the top 20. But he's a tough decision by extension of the Kenneth Walker thing. And 
Um, he's going to be too expensive in drafts to comfortably handcuff. I mean, maybe you do it. No, I'm but not. They, but that's not – I hate that. Yeah. I hate that situation. Uh, two uh, high draft capital running backs – on the same team is just not a fun situation to to manage in managed leagues. I I find at his ADP right now I have been passing on Kenneth Walker. This is why I say I'm scared because because you don't I, you, you don't have the exposure. Maybe you need exactly. I I will regret having passed on him so much, and in hindsight I'll look back and go I should have known better. <laughs> Would he have been number two in dynasty running back rankings, startup rankings? If the Charbonnet pick hadn't happened, if he would, was all would alone, it be Bijan Walker? Probably. That's what I think. Pretty. I, mean, I can say top five for sure off the top yeah. of my head, but yeah. he, I mean, very possibly at number two in the ADP zone where he is currently on sleeper. You're talking about the Jameer Gibbs zone, Aaron Jones, Joe Mixon. So when you're just if you're taking a running back right there, it's between those four guys, and that's. <laughs> That's that's a really tough decision. I would be um I'm okay with that ADP and I I'd be excited to have him as my RB2. But I would be also I'd be with Jason and the fact that I would just be holding my breath every week. Um we, we what was it? Chris Carson started the fumble. <laughs> and the fumble situation in Seattle and all of a sudden it was uh it was somebody else's turn. So number 18 Travis Etienne of the Jacksonville Jacksonville Jaguars, 24 years old. He's our RB18, which is below ADP. His ADP is RB13. Um, I've got him at 15, Jason at 19, Mike at 21. So even though I am the highest and above our, our ranking as a group, I'm still below ADP. He is a great talent. There's a lot of weapons in this offense. Uh, my main concern is related to touchdown upside and potential for him. I think it's going to come through the air and through big plays. He wasn't great near the goal line last year, and Tank Bigsby is a tank. Yes. He is a monster, and I think he's going to get all that work. I really do. The, the early reports out of camp have been very positive on Tank Bigsby. Um, he had 14 carries. This is Travis Etienne. Inside the five, he only scored three times. The similarities between Kenneth Walker yes. and Travis Etienne yes. are just astounding. They are both exceptionally explosive athletes that on any touch can house it, who last year both guys had stretches where you thought, this is the future of the position for fantasy football. And then both of these players ended up having their teams draft a day-two pick on a talented running back who's seemingly going to take goal line carries away from them because neither one of them were great in the goal line situation. So very, very similar. I, you know, if I have to choose between these guys, I like ETN a little bit better. Um, the, the fact that he is coming back to year two off of his season ending injury two years ago. I like that a lot. Um, and you know, the, the Jacksonville Jaguars offense, I think takes a big step forward. So uh, both of these guys are very, very similar. There, there was a run last year. Like, this is the potential of Travis Etienne in this offense, and you're going to see it. It, it may not be consistent, but you're going to see it. He had a run week five through eight last year, 7.1 a carry, 8.6 a carry, 8.1 a carry, 6.5 a carry. Jamal Charles was reborn for four weeks with Travis Etienne last year. He was year. ripping off 50-yard runs it's every exactly week. exactly what it looked like, though. Shot out of a cannon, started to get banged up a little bit, played 8% of snaps in week 12. Didn't really produce from that point on, and it was, you know, no touchdowns. I mean, he only scored five on the year, and four of them came in a three-week span, and so that is the concern is that without a big play and without the team transitioning to passing him the ball more, which I think he's he's completely capable of being. Oh, yeah. Like, if you made him Austin Eckler, like in the offense, he would be fine. Yeah, I mean, in college. But, but it's a matter of do they do that. In college, with – Trevor Lawrence, he was an amazing pass catching running back in the NFL. He's he's actually been a little bit inefficient in the pass catching work, but I think that's silly. He he has the the tools and the ability to be a pass catching back. Um. Okay. So, Mike, any other thoughts on Mister Etn here? He starts with Indianapolis, then Kansas City, Houston, Atlanta. Okay. Um. That's that's not a bad four pack to start the season. I I'm in agreement with Jason here of. 
I think that him and Kenneth Walker are very similar archetypes. They're, it seems like their journey in the NFL, they're just holding hands, skipping down the meadows. I have Walker one spot ahead of Travis Etienne, so I slightly like Kenneth Walker a little bit more, but not by a wide margin. James Conner comes in at 17. The one slightly <laughs> sparkling jewel in the toilet <laughs> of the Cardinals. You look looking, in that toilet and you go, oh, oh no. It's like when you put there's like, a diamond in there. You put like a disco ball light attached. In Are you going toilet? in after the diamond? Yeah. Is the question. If you, you look you going... in that dirty toilet, this is a used oh, come toilet. On. Oh, look, this it's is, the oh. Cardinals. It's a used this toilet. This is too much. If you look in that Did used you toilet that? and you see a, a like an engagement, a diamond ring, yeah, are you going after it? Are yeah. you flushing? Of course you're going after it. Okay. You can wash your hands five times. Did you see the highlight play? Yes. That's going around? Of course you I, did. I saw it. Was also tagged in it many, many times, but of the... The Cardinals took about 45 minutes to snap the ball, and then oh. when he threw the ball, it hit the defender in the back of the head. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Looked real good. It was awesome. <laughs> so... Are you with me though? Are you going? Are you diving in? Uh, Jason so, is uh, for sure. I am. I mean, you got him at thirteen. I'm at sixteen. Mike at twenty three, and he's being drafted at twenty three. So we are. Are we? Are, should we leave it in the toilet? Are we like no, cardinal biased fans here with James Conner? I, I think it's fair to be accused of that simply because when you are high on a player that is from your home team. It, it you can don't get look high like on your own supply, man. Um, yeah, they're a the, local team. <laughs> the nice thing, though, is his ADP is not outrageous. It's not someone that you know. I'm not drafting him as a top 15 running back. I wouldn't do that. He carries a lot of risk. You worry about the offense as a whole without Kyler to start, and you worry about his inability to finish complete seasons. That being said, last year when Kyler went out in week 10, I mean, you, you had James Conner from week 9 through 17. That is most of the time that Kyler was gone, and it was a bad offense. He was the running back 5 in fantasy. Like, he got it done, and the reason he got it done is because he's all that was there, and he's really good. So if you've got a guy that can get goal line, who can catch the ball, who has no competition, it kind of doesn't matter that you're on a bad offense. 68 and reception pace in that run. That's the situation you find with James Conner. Yeah, is he going to have uh, touchdown regression? Yeah, probably. He probably won't score as often as he did. Well, he but didn't there, even score last year. There's, there's also the world, though, where Kyler misses the first two, three weeks, but then he's back, and the offense is okay, and they score more points, and – all of a sudden, you've got a guy in you know the running back twenties who does have running back one upside. Look, we all have him ranked where we would you know we'd rather take him two rounds later than ETN and get the value there. But it also it, I have fears because the first eight weeks last year were a complete bust. Like James Conner was talked about this exact way, this exact way in the off season, and he was a bust for fantasy purposes. By the time you were playing him in week nine, it was you, you were probably in a different situation, and he was on a different fantasy roster. So. That freaks me out a little bit. Camp reports have been great. I saw some highlight real catches from James Conner the other day. And um, he's going to be a good friend to Cole McCoy and Clayton Toon in these really rough, disgusting defeats. The and we, rootin' tootin' shooting quarterbacks of the Arizona Cardinals. That's right. That's right. Um, 28 years old. Yeah. Is that a warning sign? It That's... It's not the it's not the best. That is a, just you know the that's the age cliff there for running backs. He has seen a good amount of work in his career, so I have him ranked you know where he is going at ADP, which that means that he's it's a fine pick. I mean, the thing, sixth round. The thing to look at is we just talked about Travis Etienne at eighteen, and we're a little bit you know behind there of of his ranking. We have James Conner ranked in front of ETN, and he's going two rounds later. So, to me, that says value. this is probably a value that I'm going to be interested in, especially if I'm starting heavy wide receiver or onesie positions. Jameer Gibbs comes in at 16, rookie running back for the Detroit Lions. There we go. A young stud yeah. running back with, I think, fewer question marks. I think he's going to be 
part of their plan from the from week one. Like this is, they're designing this off season for both him and David Montgomery to be a huge part of this offense. I think they'll share snaps together a lot. Um, the reception told us for Jameer Gibbs, like they're going to be very, very good. Yeah, he is a receiving back, and that matters so much in fantasy football. He's we, a weapon, Jason. He, yeah, that's that's he's a weapon first. Choo, he's choo, positionless. Choo. Um, these these are the quotes Explosives. being given about uh, we, Jameer Gibbs. But if you look at his, what he did as a pass catcher at Alabama, uh, the second most ever receptions for an Alabama running back, he is truly elite. Not only did he uh, catch a lot of passes, but when he caught him, just so effective. He had two drops on 103 catchable targets. He's very, very good. And a running back target is worth two and a half times more than a rush attempt. So if you want to put that in context of like, well, if you thought about he only gets 125 carries, right? Because he's a smaller back. He's not going to get a lot of work on the ground. But he gets 70 targets. That is the equivalent of 300 carries for a running back when it comes to fantasy points scored. So you don't need to be afraid of the That's workload really for Gibbs. Say it one more time. If if he were to get 125 rush attempts and 70 targets, it would be about the same opportunity as getting 300 carries alone. From a fantasy point output perspective, that's very helpful. It is non. It's a non traditional type. Like it's really easy to take Bijan Robinson, first and second down. Going to catch the ball. Three down back. Prototypical. Super handsome. Uh, Jason's in love. I mean, he's, he's super. He's a handsome man. He is. Okay, that it wasn't. It, I'm just saying. Just yeah, no, saying I, facts. Okay, he's <laughs> well spoken. I I love everything about Bijan Robinson. <laughs> he's just a. Great, he has a mustard. He's, he does. He's a great all around fella. Yeah, I heard mustache. <laughs> oh, he's no, got a he mustache. Join Arthur. Um, no, I think I think that Jameer Gibbs is is going to be a monstrous part of this offense. So uh, we can be excited. Amazingly, we're. We're not alone, though, because we're, consensus-wise, actually lower than ADP. So we might not have him because everybody else is in on Jameer Gibbs and that draft capital. Yeah, I'm I'm right at ADP with him. I've got him at running back 14. The nice thing is with him, though, if you do go after the, the chance at Gibbs, there is an unknown upside of truly elite playmaking. If you look at first-round draft capital running backs who played – at their age 21 season, which is what Jameer Gibbs is. The list is pretty much nonstop superstars and Clyde Edwards alert. Uh, that, Who still the, finished as running back 22. Yes, he, he was okay, but it's Todd Gurley, Ezekiel Elliott, Christian McCaffrey, Saquon Barkley, Josh Jacobs, Clyde Edwards alert. And now this year, we've got two guys in Bijan and, and Gibbs. Fifth ranked offensive line. It's going to be a huge upgrade for both Gibbs and David Montgomery. Coming in at 15 was, is one. My last point is Mike here <laughs> is uh, no, I'm not at 15. Um, so the, the quote from Brad Holmes, the GM said, I view him first as a weapon. If he's a weapon, forget the RB position. He's an elite explosive positionless player, which I'm sure Jameer Gibbs has documented <laughs> that statement and printed it out everywhere. It would be how I would present it when my fifth year option yeah. <laughs> is coming up. Yeah. Whoops, Brad. Sometimes you just don't need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a GM today, what you should be saying is he is definitely just a running back. Just a just yeah. a run of the mill. <laughs> can find him anywhere running back. Oh, no. The, the, the tune will change here in about two years. Right now yeah. he's on his rookie contract. Oh, he's not even a running back. He's Build him up. Build, build e the young man ETN up. ETN had a lot of comments about you know what you can control as a running back right now, and his biggest one was be a weapon in the passing game. Like Christian McCaffrey got paid. Because he is, he's more versatile. All right, 15 is Brees Hall. He is being drafted as the RB10. The people are not afraid. Mike has him at 11, Jason at 15. I'm at 19. Uh, we have a wide range of opinions on Brees Hall. We may have a, a wide range of rankings, but I don't think – I think we have the same view in the fact that, look, the, we know the variables. The variables here are – do they add another back, which this morning there was a lot more talk about Ezekiel Elliott than there was Dalvin Cook, uh, that the team remains very interested in Zeke, um, which I yeah, I didn't realize that, and then and that nothing's happened with the Dalvin Cook side. So do they add another back, and then how healthy are you? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, the, this is not something that we're going to be able to get on here and solve this problem for you. 
We can't come on here. We can tell you what we do, but I can't tell you whether or not he's going to show up week one and look like himself, whether he looks like himself in week five. Um, I would feel a lot better about Zeke going there than Dalvin Cook because I, I like I would feel like Brees Hall is going to win out quicker um, than maybe the Dalvin Cook situation. But, you know, ultimately we have a wide range of outcomes here because you don't know what you're getting in the beginning of this year. And we know that the beginning of the year, not only is he coming back from injury and there might be another back, but it's a brutal schedule. It's yes, Buffalo, it is. It's Buffalo, Dallas, New England, Kansas City to start the year with, I think, three more tough games like Denver right after that. Yeah, it, it's it's not a fun opening schedule for them. Uh, you've got the injury that will take him a little while to get all the way up to full strength. So I think when you draft him, you are – Drafting a guy where your expectation to start the season has to be a little bit nerfed. But this is also what happened last year. Last year, you go, well, he might get off to a slow start, might not be you know, yeah. the, the number one running back you know, week one, which yep. he wasn't. It was week two where he started getting a little bit more involved. And from week two on until he got injured, he was the running back four in fantasy football. He was unbelievable every week, ripping off great runs, still had a couple of runs that were like stopped at the one yard line. He could have had even uh, better fantasy finishes. He finishes the running back 21 in the last week of his season where he played 20% of snaps. The upside is what we saw. It's, it's a top five running back in an offense that should be better with Aaron Rodgers, but you're getting off to a slow start. And, and Obviously, over the last you know year and a half, I've been Mr. Brees Hall. Love Brees Hall. Love the talent. My favorite running back prospect that I've scouted in a long time. But I've been primarily more negative this offseason because I think that slow start um, and the fact that they have really kicked the tires on other running backs has said yeah. I'm not really willing to draft him where his ADP is. But the upside, I want that case made clear. He's a top five running back. Mike, what does it say to you when teams like the Jets kick the tires on Cook and Zeke when you hear, like, Denver, right? We're excited about Javante's return, and he's going to get to play in the preseason. And then you get the report this morning that they're interested in Josh Jacobs. Like, um, is there anything to read into the teams? Is this just depth, you know, insurance? You know, you spend all this money on Aaron Rodgers. You have to have insurance in the backfield. Yes, they, I, I think that's the, the huge part of it is over the next two years, the New York Jets are all in on a singular goal, and that is to get to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl. So they they have to prepare uh, their team, and they're I mean, look it's a at, nice new goal for them. <laughs> yeah, it is. And look look at the depth chart. It's like Michael Carter is he he is a limited player. Like he can help you on a football team, but you need more than that. And they got uh, uh, a band of Kanda, <laughs> and it's like. He's, but he's a rookie. They got to work dun, him in. Dun, dun, dun. So I don't mind the fact that they're looking at these veteran players because they need to have a veteran presence. A the drafting of Brees Hall is for the long term of the fantasy football season. Don't d do not fall into the trap of well, you know what? I'm not going to draft Brees Hall, and then I'm going to trade for him. I don't think that that's going to work out very well because the player holding Brees Hall knows what they are getting themselves into. And it's also a bet on yourself as a fantasy football player that I can find enough running backs later on in the draft or on the waiver wire that I'm going to fill my running back two spot for a month or whatever it takes because Brees Hall had bad matchups last year, and he was incredible. He's just – the offenses should be so much better. So I'm I'm good currently with where the depth chart is. I mean, once – if someone is added, then we'll reevaluate. But the way it stands right now, it is a very high risk pick at the beginning of the third. But this is a pick that over the second half of the season is someone who can turn into a league winning type of player. And it's just, it's very difficult to find someone that you say, yep, that guy can actually win the league for me. Agreed. All right. Aaron Jones at 14, Packers running back being drafted in the fourth round at RB 16. I got him at 11. So uh, I'm the highest of the bunch, Mike at 15, Jason at 18. Um, we've been around the block with Aaron Jones. At times it feels like the comment I made about Stephon Diggs where it's like we're just bored. We're just bored with the excellence that Aaron Jones provides. Um, the touchdown situation was really, really good for a four-year run. He's, you know, past 28 years old. 
Aaron Rodgers is not there, and the touchdowns have not flowed the past couple of years for Aaron Jones, but the talent on the field has been there. Uh, if you're right about, like, you know, is Jordan Love being underrated? Is this a division-winning team? If those things come true, I can't help but think he's going to outpace his RB16 draft position. Jones did have a very nice uh, – Catch. I mean, the catch was fine, but it was a really nice throw by Jordan Love in said uh, uh, the the eleven on eleven practice that I was talking about. So it's Aaron Jones is incredibly difficult because he's going to be turning twenty nine, and there just there aren't that many running backs that hit that level of an age, and they're still super productive for fantasy football, especially when you throw in the fact that yeah, we I can have some confidence that Jordan Love isn't. It's not going to be miserable. But I'm not going to project that Aaron that that Jordan Love carries this offense the way that Rodgers did. So that that I mean that brings down the ceiling. Now he, he's about the same age as Austin Eckler, yeah. and he's a similar skill set in terms of being explosive in the passing game. Well, huge difference to me is is the expectation of targets coming for this season. I mean, uh, Austin Eckler is someone that's usually up in the hundred target level, whereas Aaron Jones last year was 72 targets, and I, I have him projected for 60 targets this season. I think his, that number comes down without Aaron Rodgers. I think the value of each one of those targets comes down a little bit, and so at age 29, what we expect to be a slightly worse offense, and I also expect him to be slightly less involved in the passing game. I mean, 60 targets is still very involved, but less involved than he was. I personally, I mean, I've got him behind ADP. I don't see him I think this is the year where he's good, but not great. This was the RB9 last year. He's been 2, 5, 12, and 9 the last four years. I didn't realize he had finished that high. I don't agree with the target thing just because I think he's he's the best friend of a young quarterback in that situation. So I, I would expect his targets to be at or above. Yeah, I mean, the way that Aaron Rodgers has utilized Aaron Jones in the passing game in the last few years has just been so in sync that I, I I would imagine a change is going to be bad. That's not a guarantee, but um, losing Aaron Rodgers. I mean, he was the a running yards back nine. The catch was pathetic. I mean, that was the problem is he's at 395 total yards on 59 catches. But even, even around the goal line, that's where there were just plays set up really well for him. He had five receiving touchdowns. Um, which obviously is, is very high for a running back. Six the year before, two, three. Yeah, I, I think Aaron Jones is one of those players that, you know, if we believe in the Packers, then we can find the statistical backing to love Aaron Jones. And if we don't believe in Jordan Love or this offense to the same degree that we did with Aaron Rodgers, then there's lots of reasons to downgrade all the offensive pieces. I mean, A.J. Dillon, disappointment last year. You can see reasons not to like him. Dobbs is young. Watson's young. Um, it's going to go as far as Mr. Jordan Love can take it, ultimately, because, um, you know, so much hinges on that quarterback position. At 13, Miles Sanders, we have him well above ADP. His, our, his uh, ADP is running back 19. Mm -hmm. Jason has him at 12. Mike and I at 14. He's off to Carolina after four years with the Eagles. His, pan his fantasy peak in his career is RB13. Tell us why you like him, Jason. Yeah, I like him because he projects to have the backfield mostly to himself. Chuba Hubbard will be there and will be worked in. He's not going to be, you know, a Josh Jacobs level uh, target market share, carry share uh, back. But he is being brought in to be a three down workhorse back. He's being paid like that as well. And the I've brought up the the fact that the head coach, the general manager, and Miles Sanders were talking about getting him 50 receptions this year, that they want him involved in the passing game. And he's he's a very talented back. I mean, last year he was inconsistent because, you know, the vulturing of the touchdowns and, and the uninvolvement in the passing game. So you didn't really have a great experience with Miles Sanders last year, but he, he was very good, he, you know. That was when he was the running back 13, had double-digit touchdowns, great on a yards per carry. Now you go to a team that has a good offensive line. He's going to get a ton of volume. He's still young. He's being paid to be the guy. And so I just kind of see a value for where he's going right now in fantasy. Uh, if if he's going to be touching the ball 300 times, I mean, it's going to be very hard to uh, be bad. I sure. see a lot of polarization around Miles Sanders. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it comes from people being burnt by the kind of 
inconsistency that we've had from him forever and all the expectations, so now they don't want a piece of that, or if they just don't believe in this rookie-led offense under Frank Reich. Yeah, it, the the red flags for Miles Sanders would be that there's a rookie starting uh, at quarterback in week one. Since 2014, teams that started a rookie QB in week one, they averaged four and a half wins. None of them surpassed their win totals. Their running backs, only Doug Martin finished better than a running back 24. Rookie quarterbacks with Muscle nine. Muscle hamster shout yeah, out. Yeah, rookie quarterbacks with nine plus starts. Targeted running backs at just over 21%, which is slightly above the NFL average. And that's what we are betting on. Also the fact that this will be a, a very interesting uh, input for all of these statistics because the Panthers are in a division of – there's no clear, like there's there's not the juggernaut of that division right now. It, it seems like anyone right now, if things break in the in the right direction for that team, if they are the healthiest team, they could win the division, and they can win the division with seven or eight wins. All right, number twelve, my favorite running back of this bunch today, Joe Mixon, back in Cincinnati, took the discount to come back. The RB17 by ADP, Jason talked about it, lagging ADP. I think that's going to be the case mm -hmm. leading right into the season. This one is like the most flashing light, obvious, better than ADP situation in my mind. You're, you're on a football team that is expected to compete for a Super Bowl. You don't have anybody currently competent in the backfield beyond Joe Mixon, who has had productive fantasy seasons who is a talented player. He may not be the most talented, but this is that like Josh Jacobs of last year, right in my face situation where I have him at nine. It's not insane. Um, finished at 12 last year, three the year before. Yeah. I just like, you know, Travion Williams is hurt. Chase Brown's a rookie. Chris Evans. This, he's a Jag. He's come in at times and just filled the role of giving a breather. To some, I mean, Samaj P. Ryan's a good player mm -hmm. who earned third downs all the time. Joe Mixon is going to catch so many more passes than you think he's going to catch this year. That's my opinion. Is that I just, yeah. I think people would be surprised to remember that last year Joe Mixon had seventy-five targets. He was extremely involved in the passing game, and he 60 was receptions. Yeah, he and and now you lose Samaj P. Ryan. Joe Mixon is going to get an immense amount of volume for a great offense. There's not much. I mean, you could only say, well, he was inefficient last year. I don't believe he's getting better. I think he's getting worse. I think he's going to be inefficient this year. If he's inefficient this year, where you're drafting him, that's where he's going to finish. That's like his floor. He's being drafted at his floor. And even though that's kind of where I have him ranked, I completely see the, the risk reward here is you're drafting him basically where he finishes if he plays poorly and if he plays good or even just gets lucky opportunities, you know, touchdown wise, because, you know, two years ago he had 13 rushing touchdowns. That's super in the cards for him again with the Joe Burrow led Bengals. The target total you gave is with him missing games due to injury. I mean, his target pace on the year was 90 for just last season that we had him with Samaj AP run. He caught, he would have caught 73 passes still, you know, he was not efficient on the ground. I mean, that is that is the truth of the matter. But this is like you're Joe Burrow's guy in the backfield. You're going to play, as far as we know, you're going to play on third down. That's the variable. For some reason, they pull him off for somebody else. But I don't know. This one's one of my favorite values in the draft right now. Yep, I'm not going to disagree. The I think and You have him ranked right around 10, too. Yeah, so. I, I think last year, Mixon was, what, like an early second round pick. So I, there's possibility that that is – also baked in a huge over the summer. We didn't know, is Joe Mixon even going to be on this team? So I think that's the biggest contributor to why his ADP is so low. But for what there is, is what supposed to be like the dead zone of, of drafts, this is a clear starting running back on a high-powered offense. There was news that came out that he's going to be civilly sued. Sure, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then that could open him up to a um, NFL suspension. It could not now, yes, but later. That it the the way that the NFL has handled these types of cases, this seems like even even if he is like everything, he loses in court. The suspension would likely be next year. 
Uh, number 11, the last name we'll talk about at running back today, Najee Harris, Steelers running back. He was uh, He's being drafted at the RB12 right now. Jason has him at 10. I've got him at 11. Mike at 13. So we all are pretty comfortable with that spot. He feels uh, – I think one of the challenges here with Najee Harris is it just doesn't feel like the sexy pick. No, yeah, that's It fair. doesn't feel that way to me. I don't take him in mocks because I'm staring down Jameer Gibbs or something. And it's like, oh, I want to take the unknown, um, younger, more explosive, more efficient opportunity. Whereas Najee Harris is the pick that my league mates make, and then they just get week-to-week -week production from, and I'm just like, I should have done it. That's kind of what happens. And I right now, he's going to be the guy. I know Jalen Warren, we like him as a – sneaky opportunity type of player. But Najee Harris has a pretty strong stranglehold on this backfield. Yeah, he's going to get a ton of work. I, I love Jalen Warren. I think you can like both of these players at their ADP to succeed. Last year, he had the foot problem midway through the season, got the plate removed, and all of a sudden... From his shoe. was Yes, from his shoe. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, you know, he took the plate out that he was playing with. He said that was the last step uh, to kind of uh, be recovered from the injury, and he was really good the second half of the season. Uh, now, a lot of that came in touchdowns being there, whereas they weren't in the first half, so maybe it wasn't just all efficiency, but I think that that gives you an example. What he did the second half gives you an example of how good he can be with Jalen Warren on an offense that will score more this year than they did last year. I think we can universally agree that that's the most likely outcome is that the Steelers offense is just simply better this year than last year. Not necessarily that they're going to be great, but that's more scoring opportunities for Najee. He catches the, the, the ball. He's just a really well-rounded running back. And I, I agree. He's not sexy. I don't think he's got top three upside, not on this offense, but he's going to get the ball a lot in every, he's which way. Yeah. He's like, he's like, um, I don't know. Walmart Nick Chubb. Oh, I mean, I'm being sure. I'm being honest. Like it's the volume you're into. Like I, I was just uh, you won't like the comparison here either. But like looking up Cedric Benson, like the efficiency sure. numbers are very similar to what Najee's was. But guess what? 321 attempts, 273 attempts. Like Najee has a nose for the end zone, and they also just give him the ball in situations where I think maybe the efficiency will never show up on the stat sheet. You know, it's it's uh it's the fourth and one dive play. It's the um it's the goal line. Like he's probably never going to be a five a carry type of guy, but he's always going to be on the field, and we need to respect that from as a fan. And I'm talking to myself. Like I need to respect it as a fantasy player. Yeah, to me, he's the comp for me has always been Melvin Gordon. Um, obviously now that feels bad because Melvin Gordon's older, but Melvin Gordon, you know, his first couple years in the league, three point nine a carry, three point nine a carry, three point five a carry. Also, the running back seven, the running back five, the running back seven. Also had Austin Eckler coming in and stealing something. Like it, there's a lot of comps there where it's just this is an actually talented running back who for not fantasy but for NFL purposes, he's moving the chains. He's getting it done. He's picking up the yards he needs to. He's just not necessarily ripping off a 30, 40 yard run and house calling for awesome fantasy value in, uh, in an exciting play. But he will volume his way to being an, uh, an effective fantasy asset. And this, the Steelers' offense should be better. Like over that second half where Najee was better for fantasy football, it's what was the what, – what's the real reason behind that? Was it the – he took the, the play out of the shoe, he was healthy and ready to go? Or did that – contribute to like that was a big factor of the, the Steelers offense being better or was the Steelers offense better that made Najee better uh but Kenny Pickett just a a remarkable rookie season uh 1.8 percent of his passing attempts turned into a touchdown uh that is the lowest <laughs> since 1990 of quarterbacks who have started 12 games but that should that should positively regress to like even if we get league average from Kenny Pickett even if you get well below league average. <laughs> just like if best. you get well below league average, sure. it's a huge increase. Yes, I. The the division is brutal. Yeah, there the is division that. is really annoying in a lot of ways because it's like you could see any of the teams winning the division, like legitimately. Mm -hmm. Like even yeah. I have my order and I could see it going completely differently because it's just a brutal, brutal. Like 
Pittsburgh could dominate it, and I wouldn't be shocked. Uh, Cincinnati should run away with it. Wouldn't be shocked. Baltimore, great opportunity. And I believe that Cleveland has, has what it takes defensively, offensively. It's going to be really wild. Tomorrow we have the top 10 running backs on the show. We'll be moving into quarterbacks later in the week. we got preseason power-up on Thursday. We've got a mock draft again this week. So much going on. And please, like we said at the top, go check out the Ultimate Draft Kit. It's going to equip you to win on draft day. Drafts are coming. I planned a few this past week, scheduled some times. It's go time. We're going to have full preseason football here soon as well. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.